she still consults. she still consults with the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute and was recently appointed to the University of Denver to teach and supervise psychology doctoral students interested in psychosocial oncology. Dr. Scheiber, thank you for joining us today and sharing your expertise around the common challenges of cancer care caregiving. Please proceed. Thank you very much for having me. I just want to make sure can everybody hear me today and also see my slides. Is there is there an app coming? It, Caroline, it sounds a little bit muffled. It's muffled? Just a little bit. Are you on your phone or talking through your camera? No, I'm I'm actually talking through my headset on the computer. Okay. I can try to remove it and see if it's any better. Is this more clear? Yes, that's okay. Yes. Yes? Okay. We have, a, we have just a little bit of uh, background noise, but I'm not quite sure what that is, and I think Christy will do what she can to try to fix it. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead, and I hope people can hear me okay. So All right. I, thank you. So thank you for the introduction. And um, yeah, so I'll be talking uh, to you all today about understanding the common challenges of cancer caregivers. Um, okay, I'm trying to move my slides. Here we go. So just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. We're going to start off just by uh, giving a brief overview of uh, demographic data um, of cancer caregivers. Then we'll be talking about the relational nature of caregiving or between the caregiver and the patient. We'll be talking about positive as well as negative consequences of caregiving. Um, specifically, we'll be addressing caregiver burden and what that means and how it's actually operational, operation, operationalized. I'm sorry. Um, we'll be talking about a transactional model of caregiver burden that will hopefully make it more clear at what point uh, we are actually talking about caregiver burden versus a more positive outcome. Uh, we'll be talking about pitfalls of caregiving, reasons for caregiver burnout. Uh, of course, then we'll be addressing coping strategies, what you as healthcare providers can do to support caregivers, and how caregivers can best help themselves, and then I'll be ending just with some specific exercises that you could actually task caregivers with to make sure that they're doing what they need to do in order to take care of themselves and avoid burnout. So this data um, comes from the National Alliance for Caregiving, a study that was conducted in 2016, which was not only um, on cancer caregivers, but about 111 of the participants were caregivers for cancer patients. And I thought that was really interesting just to look at the demographics of, of, of caregivers, cancer caregivers specifically in the US. Um, so 58% were women, 88% cared for a relative, 39% lived with the person they were caring for, 50% reported high emotional stress related to caregiving, 25% reported high financial strain, 50% were employed full-time while also caregiving, 72% assisted with medical tasks, 40% wanted help making end-of-life decisions as mostly caregivers also tend to be the patient's MDPOAs, and 33% wanted help keeping their friend or relative safe at home. Also, what's interesting is that the average time of caregiving was approximately two years and was uh, described as episodic by the caregivers. Oops. So the relational nature of caregiving is something that I think is very important for us as healthcare professionals to know about. So there is, many research studies have shown that there is an interconnectedness between patients and caregivers, and that in fact, the caregiver's emotional health will impact the patient's emotional health. And as we know, uh, the patient's emotional health also impacts their recovery and, and thereby their, their physiological health. Um, 
So really they influence each other. In one survey of 689 patients and their caregivers, um, it showed that um, the, I'm sorry, my slide is cut off here, that, um, uh, I apologize, here we go, that um, higher levels of depression in caregivers were associated with patients' rating of lo lower quality of care. So in other words, when the caregiver was not doing well emotionally, that actually was perceived by the patient as a lower quality of, of caregiving given to them. Um, also, what, what I thought is a very interesting study of 23 patients and their caregivers that has shown that actually the um, perception of patients and caregivers differs in, in most instances, with the exception of, the emotion, of emotionally processing the initial diagnosis, managing the practical and emotional aspects of patient care, facing the fact that you know, they are facing an uncertain future and encountering symptom-related suffering, all other important areas that are associated with caregiving um, were actually perceived differently by the patients and the caregivers. And I think that is, that's very interesting because I know as, as healthcare professionals, as having, having worked in hospitals, often we take the caregiver's report as, um, you know, like as um, um, like we ask the caregivers, you know, how how is the patient doing? And actually, whatever the caregiver is telling us may not be really accurately describing how the patient is feeling. So the take the takeaway point here is that we don't want to just rely on what the caregiver is telling us, but we really need to ask the patient as well, and and vice versa. Um, so what are potential consequences of caregiving? First, I want to point out that they can be very positive. So, uh, you know, such as we've heard of like post-traumatic growth, meaning finding, acceptance, empathy, um, closer relationships, increased faith and improved health habits. So all of that impacts not just the patient, or it's, not, it's not only a potential positive consequence for the patient, but also for the caregiver. However, um, it is not to say that caregiving is also very stressful and many caregivers can experience, experience anxiety, depression, burnout, and caregiver burden as a result of caregiving. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, um, so what is caregiver burden and at what point uh, do, we, do we speak of caregiver burden? So caregiver burden is perceived when the demands on the caregiver exceed the resources available to the caregiver. So burden is perceived to be high when the difficulty of the demand outweighs the available resources, in which case coping strategies tend to determine whether the psychological consequences of the perceived burden are negative or positive. And I'll be, in order to um, explain this better, I have a, a, a model here called the transactional model of caregiver burden. And so you can see, so first um, we're talking about appraisal factors, primary appraisal factors, which of course, you know, that's the health, we're starting off with the health threat. So the diagnosis of a serious condition such as cancer. And then there is demographic antecedents that will actually contribute to how the caregiver is going to handle the, the, his or her role. Um, so um, antecedent factors include age. So for instance, being of older age as a caregiver actually puts you at higher risk for potential burnout or um, how they call it like a caregiver burden or negative uh, caregiver burden. Being of female gender is also considered a health, uh, a risk factor. Uh, having your own health problems, being employed or having to work while also caregiving is also considered a risk factor. And so is actually being of Asian, Hispanic, or African-American descent. And this is because those cultures don't tend to make use of available resources as well as um, the Caucasian culture. So um, that sort of like sets up the, uh, the caregivers. And some of that, or you know, most of that, if you will, is sort of out of our control as, as healthcare providers. So then we have the secondary appraisal factors, which um, which are divided up into the demands and the resources. So there, there's differences in caregiver, caregiver demands. Of course, some caregivers are only ask, you know, or some patients are still very independent and the caregivers 
I really only asked to kind of be there occasionally, um, maybe drive them to an appointment, or, but, but mostly the patient is available to take care of their daily living tasks independently. So of course that's uh, uh, less of a burden for a caregiver than when a patient really needs help with everything, including um, decision-making, uh, potentially showering, taking care of themselves. Uh, so when, when somebody needs 24 seven caregiving, that's of course a lot more burden on the caregiver. Um, and then, we have the resource column. So now um, we want to look at, okay, how many resources has the, has the caregiver available to them? Are there other people involved in the caregiving or is it just one caregiver? Um, does the caregiver feel supported by the health team? Um, is a palliative care team involved? And so on. So depending on you know, those resources available to the caregiver and the demands posed on them and that ratio will determine on whether or not uh, they perceive the burden of caregiving as, as acceptable or not acceptable. So of course, if the resources available to them exceed the demands put on them, then usually what we have is an acceptable outcome for the, uh, for the caregiver. Um, however, if the demands exceed the resources, then it tends to depend on how the caregiver is generally coping with, um, with, with life really, you know, how, how good are they at problem solving? How good are they at um, coping with the emotions? Do they have um, the social support and so on? And depending on those coping uh, mechanisms that they use, we have either negative psychological consequences of caregiving or positive psychological consequences of caregiving. So what are the pitfalls of caregiving? Um, so, of course, taking care of another person can be stressful. There is no question about it. Everyone has some stress, but too much can harm the caregiver's health, relationships, and enjoyment of life. Caregiver stress happens when the caregiver doesn't have time to do it all that's asked or expected of them. And they may potentially feel like they're not doing enough, not giving enough, everything falls on their shoulder, and they just can't handle it. They're just fe feeling overwhelmed. Caregiver burnout happens when they are in a state of stress or distress for a prolonged period of time. So usually burnout is something that doesn't happen, um, you know, quickly, but it's something that accumulates and builds up, um, which is also good for us as healthcare professionals to know, because that means that as we're seeing warning signs, and we'll be getting to warning signs in a little bit, um, you know, we, we can help them intervene early so that this, it doesn't actually develop into a full-blown burnout. Um, and of course, caregiver stress and burnout can affect the caregiver's mood, make them feel tense, angry, anxious, and so on, um, can make them feel out of control, unsatisfied with their lives. It can have physiological consequences for them. And unfortunately, sometimes caregivers also uh, resort to maladaptive coping strategies such as uh, substance use to deal with all of their stress. So along similar lines, so what are some reasons for the caregiver burnout? Um, you know, the fear and uncertainty associated with the cancer diagnosis and treatment of course doesn't just impact the patient, but also the caregiver, especially if the patient is a friend or a loved one. Also, uh, what's often underestimated or not paid enough attention to is the shifting of roles that are that is associated with caregiving. So now suddenly we may have a daughter taking care of of her of her father when really her father was always sort of like the strong um, role model figure. Or we have a a wife who's never really uh, ever paid attention to finances in the household, but now is suddenly you know, has to take care of that and has to kind of sort, sort through that. So all of that can be very confusing, can impact the relationships and, and just how, how the caregiver and the patient really are feeling. Um, caregiver, caregiver's feeling there's just too much to do. They can't keep up. Financial pressure, also something that cannot be underestimated. Feelings of loneliness and isolation because you might have lost a partner or you might have at least, you know, shifts in the relationship have, have happened. And the caregiver may have very little time alone. There may be constant demands on them. And then often they're feeling guilty for um, maybe not wanting to do something or not being able to do something and so on. 
So what are some warning signs for caregiver burnout? So for sure, ignoring one's own health problems or symptoms and not going to see their own doctor for regular checkups. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen caregivers who've literally fainted in our clinic before because of all the stress or whatever they had going on with themselves physiologically and they were just not taking care of themselves. Um, and sometimes also because they were feeling guilty because they are not the ones with the cancer diagnosis. Um, caregivers forget uh, or they're starting to eat poorly, they overuse substances, um, giving up exercise, losing contact with friends. All of this are just indicators that they're not taking care of themselves anymore because all of the energy is just directed um, uh, towards the cancer patient. Um, bottling up feelings of anger and frustration, having angry outbursts. I've definitely seen that too in clinic where the caregiver is just having enough and all of these are, are signs of, of potential burnout. Feeling resentful towards others, uh, potentially even blaming the cancer patient himself, him or herself for, for the situation, and then feeling guilty for that. Um, feeling tired all the time, not sleeping well, and so on. All, all, of, all of that are uh, warning signs. It's something is not going right for the caregiver. Now, talking about some coping strategies, you know, ideally, this is something that, that you as healthcare providers really want, the, want to encourage the caregivers to do, again, to help prevent burnout or at least alleviate some of that stress that they're feeling. So very important, you always want to emphasize to the caregivers to never dismiss the feelings of just stress. Very often I hear, oh, I just have stress, but I don't have to deal with cancer. I don't have cancer, so, I, so my feelings don't really count. And that is not something that's going to be sustainable because their stress is important too. Um, encourage caregivers to ask for help and accept it and accept it. In fact, I often ask them to make a list of everyone they know that could potentially help out, even with things like just making a meal, for instance, or taking the dog out, or just taking care of that one doctor's appointment. Um, encouraging, encouraging them to talk to somebody and to take care of themselves, which usually means, you know, eat well, exercise, um, sleep well. I mean, even just those basic needs are, are key, and you would be surprised how often caregivers are neglecting even those basic things. Um, encouraging them to give themselves permission to grieve, cry, and express their feelings. Um, things like meditation, yoga, listening to music, deep breathing. I mean, we know there's so much research that shows that that is just so good at activating the parasympathetic nervous system and thereby alleviating stress. Encouraging them to join a support group and giving them credit for what they're doing because they're always feeling like they're not doing enough. Um, uh, but yeah, if you put, if you give everything and you still feel like it's not enough, that just inevitably leads to burnout. So whatever they do, it is enough. Um, encouraging them to take time for themselves and making a list of priorities and accepting that they may not be able to do everything in one day. What can the healthcare team specifically do to support caregivers? So this is uh, some research from multiple studies that have shown that these are five important points that caregivers say over and over again that they need from the healthcare teams. So for one, recognition by the healthcare providers of the informal caregiver role, because very often our caregivers are not paid or really anything. It's just kind of expected that that's what they do as, as family members. But just like that recognition that even though this is an unpaid role, it is, it is an extremely important role and, and a very challenging role. Um, providing caregivers want to have information about the treatment plans, goals, anticipated complications or side effects and likely outcomes. The uncertainty is not just difficult for the patients, but it is also for the caregivers. Um, guidance from the healthcare team on how to respond to changes in patients' physical and emotional health, um, support in coping with the stress of their role, and sorry, my slide is <laughs> cut off here again, and detailed education about medical and nursing tasks that they are expected to perform, even things like giving injections, providing wound care, which seems um, you know, to be a simple task when you are a healthcare provider, but it can feel very overwhelming to the caregivers. And so any 
as much education as they can get around that, the more comfortable they're going to feel and the more supported they're going to feel. And how can caregivers best help themselves? Um, you know, so again, it's a little bit of a repetition, I apologize, but um, you know, the main thing is really you want to encourage them to just take care of their, of their basic needs, which again is, is eating well, sleeping well, setting a little bit of time for, for relaxation, getting physical checkups and exercising just at the bare minimum. Um, then taking care of their emotional health as well, if, if at all possible. Um, cancer really is a, is a marathon. And so if you burn yourself out as a caregiver, um, you know, you, you're not going to be able to sustain it. So don't feel guilty for relaxing, but it is really your duty and also one of your tasks as a caregiver to make sure that you don't burn out. And that means you have to take care of yourself. Making plans for the future with the patient so that not the entire relationship is about the caregiving, but it is, it, it, there's still things to look forward to. There's still a relationship there beyond the caregiving. Accepting and enlisting all the help that they can, um, finding sources for emotional support, and this is an important one, considering a spokesperson to handle all the updates, because I hear very often for, from caregivers that they get so many emails and messages from people that want to know what's new, and there may not be anything new. And so having a designated person to kind of handle all of these communications to the rest of friends and family um, can really help alleviate some of that um, stress or that burden for the caregiver. Here's some just specific exercises that I've given to caregivers before. <laughs> so um, that's just um, uh, some examples because again, they have, they're feeling guilty. They're having a hard time actually applying some of these things that we may tell them. So if you give them a specific task, just like you give the patient a medication list at the end or something, um, they might be more likely to do it. Um, so I like this one, suppose someone who loved you unconditionally gave you a special gift, a block of time, but there's one catch. You must use the time only for yourself. So what would you do? Um, so that could be literally like a little homework that you give them. Okay, that's it for me. I just want to say that is great information and so very true for caregivers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think so too. I would add for that piece where it says to designate one person that there's services like mylifeline.org or Caring Bridge where you can set up a site and share all the updates from there. And my lifeline even has a helping calendar so you could put rides, meals, extra people to pop in and care give. So that's a great resource to add. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Are there other questions? Denise, are you doing the intro for the next presentation? Maybe she stepped away. <laughs> uh, Caroline, thank you for that. Um, okay, so I think Janice must have stepped away for a second or she's on mute. Um, Should I, I, I'll just get rid of my presentation okay. because we're gonna put up the other one. Yes, yeah, you can stop sharing. Denise, yes, you are muted. Okay, Megan, do you want to go ahead and pull up your slides and sure. maybe we can get Janice off of mute? I was going to say, I'm happy to, to introduce myself too. So that is easier. Yeah, sorry for our technical difficulties today. Um, okay. Can you guys all see that? Yes. Perfect.
Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Kluth. I'm the Vice President of Respite Initiatives at Easter Seals, Colorado. And um, first of all, thank you to Caroline. You really laid the foundation for some conversations about some of the resources available and just kind of other things to think about when talking to families about resources. So I'm going to get into that, but just to tell you a little bit about um, the program I run, um, which is the Colorado Respite Coalition. This is certainly a resource you guys can use with your work and the families that you're supporting. Um, but if you're not aware of who we are, we're housed at Easter Seals, Colorado. Um, we're a statewide program. We serve all ages and all care needs and our focus is really on the caregiver. Um, so we provide a lot of different support to family caregivers. Um, kind of the foundation of what we do is helping navigate um, different resources with them, specifically respite, but kind of other support services as well. Um, we do some training around self-care and kind of more specifically for burnout as well as talking with professionals like all of you about how to better support caregivers. Um, and so, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that we can offer and some of our key partners that I think may be helpful for you. But I do have links throughout here and if you have any trouble accessing them, I'm happy to email them out. But one thing I want to highlight is we have a respite care navigation guide, which um, usually the first question out of people's mouths with respite care is how do you pay for it? And so the guide um, walks through all the, the different funding sources for respite in Colorado, as well as ways for um, families to get you know, small stipends to be paid for some of their care and things like that. So just wanted to point that out because that um, hopefully it helps address some of the usual you know, first questions people have about respite. And then if anybody um, is looking specifically for resources, that's our, we have a kind of a hotline for caregivers to call um, or people supporting caregivers and our website. So I think to continue the conversation from our last presentation, um, there are a lot of challenges in supporting caregivers. And I think, um, first of all, I think it's fantastic that you guys are wanting to have this conversation because it really is, um, you know, I think we always think of it, the it takes a village model with raising a child. And I very much feel the same way about caregivers. It's really bringing together kind of the team around the caregiver to um, help the person that's in need of the caregiving as, as well as the caregiver really get, get through it in a way that they're all, you know, taking care of themselves as well as possible. So some of the challenges that we see in supporting caregivers um, is there's a very common problem of caregivers often don't consider themselves exactly that. They say, well, it's my, you know, it's my husband or it's my daughter or my mom or whoever it may be. And so they really use the label of the relationship, which is the most important thing. Um, and that's important, but I think sometimes using the word caregiver can be valuable to separate things a little bit, um, as well as if you don't consider yourself a caregiver and we're kind of sharing these caregiving resources, there's a disconnect there. So I think that's one thing to be aware of. Um, I hear that very often I, people will tell these whole stories of what a day in their life looks like and then say, but I'm not a caregiver, I'm you know, so-and-so. And so sometimes you have to kind of, kind of take a step back and say, no, it sounds like you actually are providing some caregiving. Language around caregiving can be really challenging and, and sometimes I think um, kind of take caregivers aback a bit. Um, you know, this is an extremely emotional experience and as we've highlighted, it can be extremely positive and it can be really difficult. And so sometimes, um, like for example, we work a lot with families who are experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's or, or just the challenges of aging and sometimes there can be a level of denial. And so trying to bring this up can be, um, Kind of a tough conversation for people and they may just be going through their own grief or loss or just processing what's going on um, you know most people i think kind of know that this may happen to them at some point but it's not a conversation many of us really want to be having to prepare for um, I mean, the reality is it happens to most of our families at some point but um, a lot of times caregiving, caregiving comes from like a really difficult doctor's appointment or a call in the middle of the night because you know somebody had a stroke or something like that or an accident and life flips upside down. So I think sometimes we underestimate um, the need for caregivers to, to carve out that space to really process the emotions of that. And, and certainly I think we need to be sensitive to what they may be experiencing with that. Even simple things like the word caregiver versus caregiving can make a difference. There's research that was done in Minnesota that found people were consistently more 
responsive to the action of caregiving rather than the label of being a caregiver. People felt more comfortable with saying, well, I'm caregiving for my spouse. Um, so that's a very simple, you know, just a few letters that we can change to um, just being aware of things like that around um, language makes a very, very big difference when it comes to caregiving. And also, I think a lot of times caregivers, if they get to the point of, of knowing they maybe need help, it is, it is not easy to navigate the world of resources that are available for them. Um, I, think, I think sometimes people finally get to the point of asking for help and then it's just like, oh my gosh, like I have now I have to make, you know, how many more phone calls and hope that people answer and wait for calls back and, you know, wait to qualify for things. It's just, unfortunately, there aren't that many resources that are super quick and simple to get to um, throughout the state. And so I think that's just one thing to really be aware of is that um, just saying I'm ready to ask for help and find, res find resources is, you know, certainly not the last step in that process. And then challenging family dynamics. Um, we, we talk a lot in the caregiving space about the phrase loved one and if we should be using that or not because sometimes it's, it's really not a loved one or sometimes um, I have seen, you know, there's, I always say there's nothing quite like caregiving that brings out childhood dynamics among parents and siblings. Um, you know, there are some pretty tough relationships that happen with families and so sometimes um, it's you know, fairly often unfortunately that I see there's you know four or five kids, um, and the vast majority of the work is getting put on one um, for a variety of reasons. I think sometimes it's the way people are coping with it, but um, I think that's one thing to be aware of. Of sometimes it feels like, well, can't you just ask somebody else in your family to help? And and sometimes that really is not an option, um, as well as just the stress of what that can do to somebody going through a different difficult diagnosis and, and caregiving period. And I think also an, another note is with cancer or anything chronic, I mean, it, it's exactly that. It's it's chronic. It's a it's not a, you know, usually not a quick experience. And I think sometimes people's capacities for how much they can help kind of um, dwindles, unfortunately. I think, you know, if this is something that somebody's dealing with for multiple years, I think in the beginning there may be more of a support system and that just may or may not get a bit worn down. So just things to think about um, in terms of when you're kind of saying, we'll ask for help because sometimes it's there and sometimes you can work with people within their own personal support system, but you know, that's not always the case for everybody. There's also um, quite a few, there's a lot of reasons for not accessing help. So sometimes it's just like, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm gonna deal with it later and later may or may not actually happen. Um, or there's definitely a mentality we see often of, you know, well, I can't bring somebody else in to help with anything because nobody else can do it the way I can. And probably that's true. I mean, probably the caregiver is, you know, providing really, really great care to that, to their person. Um, but somebody else can, you know, come in for a couple hours and give them a break and still do a good job. But getting past that hurdle can be quite challenging. And again, I think just, I can't overemphasize just, the emotional aspects of that, even asking for help or kind of acknowledging like, you're right, I can't do this by myself. I mean, there's just, that's a hard thing for people to do in the best of circumstances. Um, and I think, you know, caregiving just adds, there's just so many different emotions and I think several of them have been highlighted, but there's a lot of anger and guilt and just, just kind of being sensitive to how much people may be processing everything that's going on. So I just wanted to make you aware, we did, um, I'm sorry, it's a bit blurry. Um, we have a campaign that's been going kind of periodically throughout the year around the state, around um, the issue of kind of the I, people not identifying necessarily as caregivers or just trying to kind of, it's not stigma, it's not the right word, but kind of the reducing the, the hesitation, I think, to ask for help. So you may or may not have seen this, but we do have a lot of different materials. So if anybody's interested in putting you know, posters or postcards in their office, I'm happy to do that. So I do also just want to make sure people are aware of kind of the key, some of the major players around the state. And I'm sorry if this is like repeat information, but sometimes I'm kind of surprised when um, people maybe are, may or may not be aware of this or it's just a quick refresher. Um, so there's the area agencies on aging, which serve um, people 60 plus around the state. There's 16 of them. I describe them as a one-stop shop for older adult resources. 
So sometimes we see cases of the, these resources might be great for the person that needs the care, but they may also be great for the caregiver. Um, and so there are people whose jobs it is to sit down and really walk through the different resources available. And so I really, um, when anybody's 60 plus, like I just encourage them that for that to be the starting point. Um, so for the Denver area, it's the, it's people call it Dr. Cog, but Denver Regional Council of Governments and, and they're all over the state. Similarly, there's the Aging and Disability Resources for Colorado, which is quite a mouthful. Um, they also do work with older adults 60 plus, as well as people with disabilities or kind of, you know, really chronic um, challenges that are 18 plus. And for the most part, they're actually, the, those two groups are housed in the same place, except for in a couple spots in the state. There's also the single entry points, which provide case management for quite a few of the Medicaid waivers. Um, and then Colorado Crisis Services, particularly, I mean, this is not ideally where we want to send caregivers, but you know, there are cases when that truly is the best option because people have reached um, such a level of burnout or just just truly need um, that level of help. So I think that's always an important one to remind people about. And then there's also just tons of different community-based organizations in, um, all over the state that kind of each provide their own um, support. And so we have a list of those on our website. Just wanted to draw attention to that. Okay, so in terms of resources and kind of some of the key things that may be helpful for caregivers, um, I think the like the number one thing I would say if you walk away with nothing else from this is being pro like the biggest thing for families is being proactive and and I think particularly for people who are working with families, oftentimes I think it's other people that see burnout before the caregiver does or before I mean anybody does in themselves. Um, something may just be off. And so I think if you're working consistently with a caregiver in your professional life or your personal life and you're seeing the signs, like really finding a way to, to talk with them and working with them to be proactive. Um, because most of the time we get calls from families that are in crisis mode and we can work with that, but it, it's much more challenging. Um, and so I mean, I think there's, you know, I think when somebody's dealing with caregiving, there's kind of only so much capacity to really think that far ahead. Um, but if you can kind of encourage people to even just be thinking about it, even if they don't need, like say they're not at a point of needing respite care or another resource, just kind of continually reminding them can be really helpful um, in, a, you know, in a way that feels appropriate or, or comfortable. Um, but I, I just can't emphasize enough, like the being proactive, not only because it takes time usually to set up these resources and just crisis, like emergency resources just often aren't there. Um, but it's also just, I think, a good way for people to kind of start thinking through like what might be helpful when they have a little bit more of an emotional capacity to be thinking about it. And then also just be realistic about what resources may be available. I think, um, again, I think it's fantastic that we're having this conversation today. I really feel like um, people that are around caregivers, just the more knowledge that they can be equipped with, the better for everybody. But I think sometimes there's a bit of an assumption about what's available. And I, I had somebody, I had a family call me about a month ago, and this case has really stuck with me, where she called and she said, well, I just got out of the doctor's office and I'm exhausted and the doctor prescribed two weeks of respite, and which we hear that very rarely, but every now and again. Um, and we like, honestly, we couldn't find anything. I mean, and there was no way to pay for it. Um, but there was a bit of an assumption of, well, that exists in like, you know, two weeks will will be helpful. And it was really, it was frustrating on our end, because I don't ever want to dangle hope in front of families that, you know, these services can be extremely expensive if you don't have a funding source. And so I just think it's important while we're talking about it's great to be proactive, it's great to work with families, but I also think being really honest about what's available and finding ways that truly work for the family is, is important. So if you're not familiar, respite care, um, it, you know, I think that term gets thrown out a lot, but sometimes like we have a pretty, pretty loose definition in our program, so I'll just kind of explain that, but um, really it can be provided in, in your home, so maybe somebody coming in to provide a break or it could be out in a community setting, um, like for example, like a day program or a more recreational setting or um, just you know, at some place in the community. 
it can be provided by professionals, but it can certainly be provided by family or friends, or there are a few volunteer respite programs around the state. Um, and then it's really just a chance for the caregiver to get a ch to be able to walk away and take a break um, for whatever amount of time. Sometimes people ask me like, well, is it respite if it's two hours? Absolutely. I mean, it could be two hours, it could be a weekend, whatever that looks like. And I'm a big believer in that respite is oftentimes people say it's just for the caregiver and I don't believe that. I think it's just as much for the person receiving care. And sometimes that's a helpful way to frame it um, when you're talking to a caregiver because they may be like, well, I can't. I just can't walk away and nobody can do it as well as I can say, okay, like I understand, but you know, maybe, maybe your husband might, you know, enjoy this, you know, maybe there's something that can kind of, um, you know, loosen it. So it doesn't feel, they don't feel quite as guilty about taking time for, for just them. Like every relationship in the world needs a, a break at some point. Um, it's just good for people to be able to walk away and recharge a little bit. It is important to note though that it can be tricky to find the right provider. Um, I think particularly if we're talking about people that have higher medical needs, it's not always easy to find a really good provider that works for that family and it may just take time. So again, when people are calling and saying like, I'm exhausted and I can't do it and I need somebody tomorrow, that's pretty tough. Um, and I think that's gonna be pretty tough no matter where you are in the state. I'm not saying it's impossible, but um, just know that. And it, it can also be extremely expensive. Um, I think that can be pretty staggering for people. I mean, respite care can range pretty easily from $20 to, to $35 an hour. And so um, without the right funding sources, which you know exist for certain need levels, that's just something for people to be aware of. And that's probably part of the, the being proactive as well, is just like thinking through financially what that looks like for your family. We talked a little bit earlier about support groups. That can that in a lot of ways can be respite for somebody um, and just finding that there is a community of people going through this as well. Caregiving can be extremely isolating, which can definitely be part of the burnout where people feel like the entire load is on them and nobody else can really understand. And so having a space where they can, in a healthy way, vent and, um, and as well as learning from other caregivers, I've found um, sometimes I'll, you know, I teach different classes and sometimes it's like the most valuable thing that a caregiver can do is just talk to other people, either to just kind of have some time to, breathe a little bit, but also to just hear about little tips and tricks that other families have, have found. Um, pointing them to the care, to caregiver training, and that's something if you're interested, I'm happy to, to chat later about. Um, but for example, I teach a class called the Stress Busting Program in the Denver area, and there's a few people around the state that teach it, and it's a nine-week class for caregivers that's um, it's kind of part training and a little bit of a support group element. So we do stress strategies and just kind of provide a space once a week for nine weeks for them to really kind of talk about what's going on in their own family and learn strategies to really help them cope. Um, I think another area particularly, um, I mean, sometimes it's just a better fit and sometimes financially it's a good option too, is really working with families to think about who beyond um, even just like their close-knit friends and family might be able to help if they're involved with the faith community or their groups, or their volunteers that might be able to come in and and provide a break or you know other resources that may exist within those communities or or any other kind of personal networks like that um, i think also if you're particularly if your focus area is the patient it's so important to actually ask the caregiver specifically how they're doing um, i think that happens more often than i would like to see happen personally where there's such a focus on you know how are you doing how are you feeling on the patient and that's absolutely important but also i mean the quality of of how or like how the caregiver is doing is going to directly impact the quality of care and the quality of life really for that patient and so i think sometimes um, i actually catch myself doing that sometimes like if i know somebody's not not doing well i kind of you know think it's the human reaction to just say like oh how are you and then you but also make sure that you're turning to the caregiver saying but really how are you um and then kind of we've talked about signs of burnout so helping to um, identify those and people that you're seeing and then also just being creative um, again it can be hard to find these resources or put them together but sometimes it's reframing things a little bit so for example one one we do often is you know, the respite may or may not be available, but would it help if um, meals were delivered three times a week just to kind of lighten the load a little bit for the, 
for the caregiver, it's one less meal you need to prepare. Um, and then can you kind of use that time that you might have used for, for cooking to just, you know, step outside, get a little fresh air, whatever that looks like. So sometimes it's just a, a different level of creativity. And then these are pretty basic. I think we all know kind of the general stress management strategies. Um, it's just hard to do them, I think, for, for all of us. Um, but these are some of the ones that we teach in our classes. So, you know, meditation, yoga was mentioned earlier. Um, coloring books are fantastic for caregivers. I think I am a big fan of anything a caregiver can do either in their own time, which is I think the primary goal, but also with the person they're caring for, where they may, I mean, sometimes the reality is you can't leave the room or you really can't get respite, but is there a way that you can do something to kind of turn your mind off and just really enjoy that time with the person you're caring for too? I think sometimes as a caregiver, like there can be really great moments with um, whoever you're caring for, but sometimes you just, you both need like time to just do something fun and relaxing and not be running from appointment to appointment. And then just also thinking about what's truly practical, um, whether that's cost or amount of time or whatever that looks like. But I think simple, practical things that caregivers can do are, are really key. Or it may be things they're already doing or things like, I mean, I always hear like, well, I don't have time and say, well, did you have time to brush your teeth today or did you have time to take a shower? And, and sometimes the answer is no, because the level of stress is that high, but you know, it can be as simple as just like being more mindful about brushing your teeth um, or making sure that's your time. So maybe you listen to your favorite song while you're brushing your teeth or take a few deep breaths or whatever that looks like. Like it can be that simple and it can be that quick. And then these are just a few tools we have. Um, we put the, the wellness toolkit together at the top. And again, if any of these links don't work, I'm happy to email them out. But um, just a few ideas for things you can share with caregivers or just do on your own to help anybody in your life. Um, but yeah, feel free to, to take them or print them or whatever you want to do. And then I always like to end with this quote from Dana Reeve. Um, it is so important as a caregiver not to become so enmeshed in the role that you lose yourself. It's neither good for you nor your loved one. And that's so true. I think oftentimes when you've been caregiving for, for you know, years in many cases, you know, you may be, you may just feel like you're Megan the caregiver and not Megan who's a caregiver and all the other things that make up you know, me as a person. And so I think it's really important to help people remember that that caregiving may be a huge part of their life, but it's not everything. Um, and so finding those things that really, um, you know, spark a little bit of joy for them or help them be able to take a break and come back um, refreshed. And that is it for me. Are there any questions? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> Something happened with my phone when I needed it and couldn't get back on. So I am just checking in to see how we're doing. We're, we ran over time a bit in the presentation, and Megan, it was very informative as it was for Caroline as well. I appreciate your posting your contact information here. Um, because the um, presentation is in the PowerPoint, do you want us to put that on? online so that people can connect to those links or save it as a PDF on uh, our site. I'm fine with either one. Okay, very good. Well, in the interest of time, we have five more minutes left. Thank you, Megan. Um, Caroline, did you have a couple other things you wanted to go over real quickly? <clears throat> um, no, just happy Thanksgiving and our speakers were terrific. Yes. Oh, very, very true. Very true. Uh, if there isn't anything more on the agenda, do other listeners have a question for Megan in the few minutes we have left? Is the stress busting class free or is there a fee? Nope, it's free. Um, so we are getting ready to do, we do them twice a year in Denver typically, and we do one that's chronic condition focused and one that's dementia. So our next one's going to be dementia focused. And then usually the latter half of the year, we do the chronic conditions. Um, but you've got my contact information. So if you're interested, just send me an email and I can send you a little bit more about it. But yeah, no, oh, pretty much all the trainings we do are free. Amazing. Thank you.
Yes, it's very, very helpful. We can uh, post that and share that with our yeah. family caregivers as well. I think nine weeks sounds like a lot, but I'm always amazed at how quickly it goes, and, and people seem to really like the class.